Hi guys, my name is Chris and I'm a senior software engineer in New York City, and this is my full process for writing software as a front-end developer. I'll take you through everything from planning with product and design, to communicating contracts with backend, to coordinating testing with QA, to effective code review and deployment. So this is my full process for building a software feature based on my last two jobs as a senior engineer with Caesars Entertainment and now as a senior engineer with Conexa, which is a small health tech startup. Obviously, this is just my two cents and what has worked for me, your mileage may vary. First, I'll be in some kind of meeting with a product manager, a backend developer, a designer, and a QA person. This typically tends to be a small squad of people dedicated to this single feature, and at least in my experience, this has been an effective strategy. Obviously, other companies may handle this process differently, but the problem with having multiple people of the same discipline working on the same feature at one time, or even worse, swapping out one person for another halfway through the feature build, ultimately slows down development because there is so much knowledge transfer to do. Knowledge transfer can be a great thing to do between teams or between members of a team, but not mid-feature build. Ideally, the product person and designer will have already discussed the feature and should bring the bones of the UX and UI to be refined. This usually means the product person bringing a script defining user scenarios and the designer bringing some Figma or sketch files. The rough outline of the feature itself will have already been determined as part of an already existing larger product roadmap and set of timelines. As a group, we'll take a look at the description of the UX of the feature which the product person has come up with, as well as some preliminary design ideas, and try to make a best judgment call as far as what we think will work from a technical perspective, and more specifically, if anything definitely will not work. For example, and this is a very conflated example, but hopefully it proves the point. If a product person came to the table with an idea for a feature which for some reason needs to send 1000 GET requests to some service when a user clicks a button, the engineers would probably be wise to try and steer the product person and or designer in a different direction. But it might not always be this drastic. Sometimes it just might be a feature that needs a design tweak based on existing development constraints. For example, if the design and development teams have previously committed to using a design system like Material UI, and the designer wants us to create some kind of custom component which doesn't exist as an out-of-the-box solution with material, we can weigh the pros and cons of creating something completely custom or scrapping and redefining the feature to not need this particular component. Usually this decision will weigh constraints like deadlines, what other projects or features are also in scope at the same time, and how hard the powers that be, that is, management, is pushing for this feature. When we've arrived at a point where we can comfortably say with confidence that from a technical perspective this feature will work, we'll coordinate functionality, that being the actual business logic of the feature. As a front-end developer, this is typically not something that I personally spend time on, as often, the majority of the planning for the business logic falls on back-end responsibility. But what I do make sure to do is coordinate with the backend developer on what API routes need to be exposed. This would be all of your gets, posts, and so on. For example, if you're working on building out a news feed like Twitter, you'll need some kind of a get to expose all of the tweets a user should see from the people they're following, and a post to create a new tweet. If you've ever studied system design while preparing for a technical interview, this kind of thing should be familiar. We'll also try and identify any edge cases that might crop up as early as possible. For example, if a Twitter user refreshes the page while they are still editing a new tweet, or if they rapidly hit the tweet button multiple times in a row, what should happen? These are both edge cases that would be solved by front-end only solutions, but with any feature there may be examples where the back-end is necessarily affected as well. This becomes particularly important when you're paying for external APIs. If you accidentally hit a third-party vendor's get on repeat because of an incorrectly implemented set interval in your code, you could end up costing your company a lot of money if you exceed your service limit. Not great. Another thing to explore in addition to necessary contracts exposed to the front end is the shape of the data needed to be sent back. While the exact particulars of the data sent back can be refined later on in the development process, it's usually useful to have the contracts mapped out from the beginning, especially with GraphQL. I'll give two examples to illustrate this. The first is using REST. Let's say we're building a sports betting application. We know that on the home page, the user will need to send a get for all of the bettable sports, football, basketball, soccer, etc. So if the front end and back end developers have established that there needs to be a get contract which takes in a user ID and the user's location and will send back an array of sports. So even before the back end functionality to support this operation is complete, 
we at least know what the request will need to look like, and we can build out the data transforms on the front end in anticipation of when that functionality becomes available. So let's say in this scenario, a sport consists of an object with an ID and a name. We can start building out the logic which will support our UI based on the assumption that we will have these two properties present. And with GraphQL, we have a similar precedent. We can assume the same get contract will need to take in a user ID and user location, and we'll spit out an array of objects where each object representing a sport has an ID and a name, and we can build out our logic from there, again, before the backend functionality is necessarily even in place. One of the nice advantages to GraphQL, however, is that we can use our GraphQL schema to automatically generate type schema if we're using TypeScript, and that will help make our UI development process even faster. But we can talk about that in another video. Usually while I'm working on a feature, I'll create my own document of use cases and edge cases based on UI and backend contracts. Typically, this will look slightly different than the requirements drawn up by the product person because they're focusing solely on the end user's experience, whereas I'm focusing on technical implementation. I will then pass this document back to the product person to make any refinements they might need to their own document as well as use it to coordinate testing with the QA person. Coordinating testing can be super important because you basically want to make sure there's no overlapping work. If I create a unit test for my work that covers a certain scenario, what I don't want is for my QA person to additionally create an automation test that covers the exact same scenario. That's just unnecessary duplication and is likely a waste of someone's time. This can be avoided by coordinating ahead of time. I start with the technical implementation by writing all my CRUD operations. At this point, the backend functionality may or may not yet be functional. This not only gets me off the ground faster when it's time to build out the UI elements, but also lets my backend developer know as early as possible if some functionality is not working at the time when that stuff does come online. For example, with GraphQL, I can build out all of my queries using the GraphQL playground, test them, generate any TypeScript types that I need, and let the backend dev know if, for example, a query is returning an empty object where it should be returning data, or if some service is completely down. Next, I'll take care of any necessary data transforms. For example, I might have a get operation that returns an array of data where each object in the array has an ID. Depending on the UI I'm building, it might be more useful later on if I know that I will need to do some kind of lookup by ID to have a data structure ready to go where I can do a constant time lookup. So in this scenario, I would transform the array from something like this to an object of IDs like this. This way, if we can't avoid doing some kind of n squared operation, we can at least try to get it done ahead of time rather than later on during a user interaction, which could slow down their experience. Next, I'll start working on the UI. The order I work on things varies depending on the feature, but in general, I usually try to think of things in modules. For example, if I have to build out a page which has two sections and each of those sections has different functionality, I'll build the page, build a section component, render two section components to the page, and then focus on building the particulars of one section. This allows me to break the sectioned work into multiple PRs by section. Usually I try to keep PRs to no more than a few files at a time, but obviously this is not always in line with the particulars of a feature. This also depends on your company's deployment strategy. If your company has some kind of continuous deployment where any code which is merged automatically goes into a live environment, You'll want to be selective about how you push your code. You don't want a half-finished feature to be live. Usually the best way to mitigate this is to have a deployment process where there is an intermediary stage where your ready code sits before a release is cut and promoted to a live environment. This ensures that only code which is ready by product standards will ever go live. When the feature is ready, I'll push it up and create a PR. There are a lot of resources out there already on how to write and review a good PR, so I'll leave the particulars of that out for this one. But the gist of it is that I'll make sure the code is ready to go, meaning comments are placed appropriately where needed, console logs and any other code left over that was purely used for development is taken out, and all scenarios described in my feature doc have been adequately tested locally. When I say testing here, I'm referring to manual testing to make sure that things actually do what they're supposed to do, as well as unit testing. Again, there are a lot of resources out there already on unit testing, so I won't go into that here. Personally, I don't write automation or end-to-end -end testing. That's just not something that's been part of any of the roles I've worked on at large companies, as there is usually a dedicated team which focuses exclusively on this. Again, this is where I might go back and just do a check-in with the QA person to make sure that we're still aligned on test coverage. 
Anecdotally, I think this team breakout works well as there is less of an onus of responsibility on developers to both write the feature as well as spend a ton of time on testing. Also keeping in mind that often all of this work is done under some kind of time constraint. Meanwhile, other developers on my team have been assigned to review my PR and will leave comments about which coding practices to revise or if I missed anything in terms of functionality. I'll go back and make some revisions, and when my teammates give me the thumbs up, the PR can be merged. From there, I'll move on to working on the other UI sections. I hope this has been helpful. Obviously, this can change pretty drastically based on your company's needs and the amount of scope that you decide to take on in your own role. Let me know if I missed anything important. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.